Is your 401k optimized for tax growth, efficient growth, growth of all kinds? Or are you still in some kind of target date fund like I was and really don't understand what you're investing? If any of those questions you answer to are yes, you'll want to stick around. I do appreciate everyone for tuning in today and liking and subscribing as always. Or as we head towards the end of the year, I'm going to be looking at some new and interesting topics that you have emailed and posted about. Okay. So if, you're, if your 401k is not optimized and it's not where you think it is, or if you're like me and I had been invested in a target date fund for several years, wasn't really paying attention, I know, uh, I've taken some heat for that. I've not paid attention to my retirement as much as I should have, and now I've done a big change. This was actually several months ago. I moved all my 401k uh, over to a uh, index fund managed by Fidelity. But today we're gonna unravel some of the potential of the FXAIX as a cornerstone of a 401k and some of the challenges traditional retirement investment strategies have. So uh, as I move over into here, we're gonna actually look at first, understand what a target date fund is. I'm not gonna get too deep into this, but a target date fund is generally uh, a type of mutual fund or index fund that will have a mix of fixed equities uh, or uh, stocks, fixed equities, and some cash. As you get older, they unwind out of stocks, move more into bonds, and move more into cash. They provide a very simple way for retirement. They provide exposure to a mix of active and passive management, and it's very simple to turn on. So like it says here, simplicity of choice, okay. You do get something for everyone. So if you wanna do active management in most most 401k plans, you can do that and, and there is passive. So sounds great, what's the issue? Why did I even look at this? This actually started because I was going through a lot of my accounts over the summer and looking at what I was paying in my expense ratio. I've talked about this many times on the channel and what an expense ratio and fees in a portfolio of any kind, it's not necessarily retirement, but what that can do. And lo and behold, the fees I was paying for my target date fund were astonishing. Way more than what I, I uh, normally pay for anything. If you've watched this channel for a while, you'll understand how much, how bullish I am on index funds, funds that mirror the S&P 500, setting and forgetting that. Well, I took my own advice and I did move a bunch over and I'll show you that later on in the video. If the fees aren't the issue, what is? Well, they're not all, funds are not all created equal. And these are just a couple of the funds I'm looking at. This Vanguard Target Date 2045 is one and the Fidelity Freedom 2045. I was actually invested in the Fidelity 2055 fund that mirrors a lot of what the 2045 does, but you have an equity portion, a fixed income, the allocation, some of it's US, some of it's international. Same thing with T. Rowe Price and Vanguard. This one, it really hits the nail on the head. You have funds of funds and what that is is you may have uh, an equity portion and then under that you might have uh, U.S. stocks, you might have international stocks, you might have develop, developing nation stocks, dividend stocks, you've got funds of funds. A lot of those expenses start to add up. And when you really do the math over say a 30 or 40 year time horizon of what that expense ratio can look like, it really starts to snowball and you really see your earnings and your earning potential get dragged down by expenses. Uh, the, a couple other things here I'll, I'll point out. Um, so if you're interested in outside gains and maybe tech or bio or a consumer discretionary or industrials, whatever that is, a target date fund is not going to be for you. It's way too broad. Okay, let's move over into another article here from Forbes real quick before I jump into the portfolio. Uh, this walks through what a target date fund is. And I will say here, uh, if you scroll down to the middle, this target date fund uh, diversification portion will tell you, hey, this Vanguard stock market index fund is could be 54%, 36, etc. cetera. Uh, but that's one mix, one mix here in your 401k or your IRA that you could do. If I move down here though, this is the meat of it. Target funds can be too broad. So that was my core issue outside of expense ratio was the Fidelity 2055 fund was way too broad for me. I was touching everything. And while from a diversification and risk management standpoint, that's great. I felt like I was leaving a lot of money on the table again, because I was paying a higher, a higher expense ratio for the fund, but I'm not categorized and capitalized on areas where I feel there's tremendous growth, such as the United States, such as tech. And that's where F, uh, the FXAI portfolio or the uh, index fund comes in on top of being too broad again they can be too conservative so there was a study done by university of illinois urbania and mit and the target fund that found at, uh, on a whole the target funds become too conservative for most people around the age of 50. i'm not close to 50 but i will say it was already too conservative for me uh, and if I, they look here using a complicated model, they found that an upper middle class couple without access to family wealth should put 80% of their portfolio in stocks at age 45 
and then declined to steady 60 during retirement. Yeah, I would say 80% with a dual income household in the upper middle class in the United States, 80%, you could do that for the long haul and then just do 20% in bonds. And at some point, you'll probably want to ratchet that down to 50% stock and 50% bonds. But when you're younger, you want to have as much, take on as much risk as you can, simply because if things go south, you have a, you have a lot more time to recover those losses. Now, if you look down here, here's some of the Fidelity market index funds you can get into. 0 0.02, 0 0.06, 0 0.03, these are the, the expense ratios. Now, for those of you paying attention, and you maybe you've already looked at what FXAIX is, I want you to comment down below what you think the expense ratio is. What do you think FXAIX is? And what do you think FDEEX, which is my target date fund, what do you think the difference is in expense ratio is? And then as a bonus, I want you to comment down below and let me know how much you think over 30 years that outsized expense ratio will cost someone, mainly you if you're not paying attention, in retirement and in lost uh, revenue just from paying fees. All right, so real quick, I actually went over to Reddit as well, and there's tons of different subreddits, and I'll comment, I'll, I'll link these down below. But you know, is a portfolio of target date retirement funds good enough? You know, you can read through here, and it's not just an article, but these are actual people uh, commenting. Okay, so if you look up uh, on the Motley Fool here, it'll actually walk you through. Uh, some of the some of the pros and cons uh, of tar uh, investing in target date funds or what your retirement could look like. And lo and behold, the first one they bring up is FXAIX, which is what I invested in. And if you wanna get exposure, it says here, it's a great way to invest in the market through a single fund that tracks the performance of all stocks and average since 1988 has averaged 11%. Well, I can tell you right now, I was not getting 11% in my 2055 target date fund. I wasn't getting anywhere near that and I was paying a lot more in expenses. So again, I want you to be careful when you sign up for a 401k or an IRA through your employer. I want you to be careful and make sure you're not always just choosing the target date fund. I'm not saying it's wrong for everyone, but I'm saying that for certain individuals, that may be interested in expenses that are more actively managing their portfolio and their overall investment, an, a target day fund could be a serious problem if you're not paying attention. You do get a lot of dividends from uh, FXAIX. I've quite a bit of dividend just since the summer. So I, I moved, I believe it was August, I moved everything out of my target date fund and into this Fidelity fund. And if you look here, you'll actually see for every 10,000 invested um, at $140 per share, you'll get um, you'll be able to purchase 71 shares of the fund at a 1.35% 1 1 annual dividend. Uh, you will grow 72 shares one year, 73, and after year two through dividend reinvestment. I have dividend reinvestment turned on in my 401k, um, and I don't plan on turning it off. Um, and then I'll, the other thing I like with this is, at any time, if I want to, I can move over into a different fund. Obviously, my 401k is through Fidelity, so I'm not gonna be able to invest in a T. Rowe or a Vanguard but you can see some of the outsized gains that you get from investing in uh, a different fund outside of a target date fund. Okay, I'll move over into Fidelity real quick and we'll see, I actually broke down, this is where the meat starts to really come in. What does it look like a Fidelity index fund, the one I'm investing in now, my old 2055 fund, and then QQQ, which is just a ETF that tracks the S&P 500 um, and it's categorized, it's categorized as large growth. If I look here, I can see that uh, QQQ has beat both of them. But if I take QQQ off and I just compare uh, my new FX AIX fund, my new retirement fund to my old target date fund, uh, you're seeing outsized gains in almost $9,000 over the course of the last, uh, oh, let's see, what is that? Last 10 years, uh, if I started with, I think it was zero. Uh, no, I start, sorry, I started with $10,000. At the end of the last 10 years, I'll have made um, almost triple my money versus double. So I've left almost $9,000 uh, out of my portfolio just from loss of performance and from expense uh, expenses on the fund. I think the uh, the fees here, so for those of you that did comment uh, and, you're, and you're wondering what it is, okay, uh, here's the fee. So the fee on my new fund is 0 0.015, not 0 0.15, 0 0.015 on my old expense, or my old uh, 2055 fund, 0.75. So 0.015 to 0.75. So 0.75 is uh, almost getting close to 1%. We're almost in an actively managed portfolio uh, where I would expect the losses or the, the gains to be 
uh, much superior than a passive. So not only am I getting better asset allocation, that's one, I'm getting a better mix of options, that's two, I'm getting a lower expense ratio, that's three, and I'm getting uh, out, bigger outsized gains with my new, uh, with the 500 index fund. So those are all huge reasons I moved over. And I will say, I think it's, I think there could be, I know there could be a lot better education on this when it comes to retirement planning. I did read an article recently that said around 50% of Americans uh, don't even have uh, really anything socked away for retirement outside of social security. I think we need to all do a better job of enablement and making sure people understand what's in their retirement fund. Even people like me that take finance very seriously and are looking at the market and looking at uh, their the indexes and, and their allocation every day. Uh, the 401k is something I'd really slept on. I was not paying as much attention as I should. Uh, if I move over into FXAIX, the new 500 index fund, uh, no surprise, the asset allocation here and what it's invested in the top 10 holdings Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA. This is outsized uh, in terms of holdings on tech. Now, I know a lot of people are gonna, I'm just waiting for the comments below to say, tech's gonna get slaughtered, it's an election year coming up, the best is behind it. Um, but I mean, if you just look at Microsoft, Microsoft is one of my biggest dividend compounders. Microsoft is an absolute beast. It, it's performed under Satya Nadella, it's done great. And if you look at the, the rest of these, I don't see a world where these don't continue to grow, pay dividends, not all of them, but the Microsofts, uh, the Apples, the Googles, they're all paying dividends. I don't see that going away. Uh, and by the way, you can invest in this fund without actually, uh, it doesn't have to be in a 401k. I should have brought that up earlier. You don't actually have, the, have this in a 401k. Now, if you go into Fidelity, you can actually see the fund managers. You can see where the, uh, the top sector is IT, like I said before. But this seeks to provide investment results to correspond to the total return and the performance of common stock publicly traded uh, in the United States of um, you know, a broad-based index fund. Normal investing, 80% of assets in common stock include the S&P 500. And if I look over here, it actually will give me some similar portfolios to choose from. Mega, large, growth, dividend. Some of these I didn't have access to because they're in my 401k, but if you're generally investing in something like this, you can invest in some of these other ones if you just wanna go dividend or you're just interested in mega cap or, or large, whatever that may be. Uh, I can look down here at the benchmark. I've been very impressed with this. The life of this fund has yielded uh, almost 11% before taxes. And that's right on the benchmark with what they're paying, uh, a primary benchmark of the 500. And the Fidelity Index Fund, yeah, over the last 10 years has uh, yielded 11.32%. So I'm, I'm very happy. If I look over at my old fund though, uh, and what I was paying, the rating's a little bit lower, the returns are a little bit lower, the expenses are much higher. They're investing in things that are, uh, if I go look over here, they're investing in US equities, non-US equities, but look at all these funds. So I talked earlier about funds of funds of funds of funds. Each one of these is a fund and each one of these has an expense ratio attached to it. Although it might be small, it's still in there. Two active managers. And if I go over here, I can actually see what's in here. This is gonna be a, a bigger, a large blend, not a mega cap blend. And since inception uh, in 2011, uh, let's see, what is it? Oh, here we go, fees. Yep, here we go, fees. 0.75, which is just incredible. I kicked myself for letting this run for so long, but I could have saved so much money in expenses. Uh, I really I really do kick myself, uh, I kick myself for that. Now that's that value, $13, but the expense ratio, God, you gotta be careful with this. So uh, in conclusion, having moved over uh, about $250,000 outside of this fund into the uh, 500 index fund. What did I learn? Well, one, expenses matter. Two, know where your money is. Even if you're contributing every month or every two weeks into your 401k or IRA, IRA you need to pay attention. Uh, and number three, you need to really understand and accept what you're investing in. So I I'm wanted to invest in a 500 index fund of the biggest top 500 stocks. Um, and I'm okay with the holding here. You see on the top 10 holding here, this is what I want. I don't wanna be invested in uh, you know, trip, uh, funds of funds of funds and paying expense ratios, that's number two. Uh, and then number three, look as long as you can from an outsized gains perspective, what has this, whatever fund you're invested in, what has it done over the years? And number four, dividends are always your friend. So the amount of money I've made just off dividends since I moved uh, my money over has been wonderful. Uh, those are all being reinvested. I don't pull any money out because it's a 401k, but that will just sit there and compound and compound and compound. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the comment section, drop me a comment, hit the like button, subscribe if you will. 
And as always, don't forget, design your financial freedom. Take care. Bye-bye.